All right, it's actually a uh, field trip day here at Rosedale Tech. I have my class with me. We're at one of the garages I work for. Got six of my students with me. And uh, we're working on a 1999 uh, Mercury Mountaineer. And the complaint is a check engine light and some lean exhaust trouble code. So we have the scanner hooked up. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom you in on this on the screen here and we're gonna get some trouble codes out of this. All right, so I'm in my codes menu already. One of the things you gotta remember about Fords, Fords are kinda goofy as far as their code memory and what they run, uh, what they'll have is a key on engine off self test, which what that does is, is a computer will do checks on itself with the key on engine off. It's basically a, a functional test. Uh, same thing with the key on engine run, but the key on engine run is gonna do things that it can't do with the engine off, things like EGR flow, oxygen sensor activity and things like that. I'm not worried about that on this year. On this year, we're gonna go right after the memory codes. Click memory codes, hit continue, and uh, we have an issue, obviously. Two different codes, PO171, PO174, and that's bank one, too lean, bank two, too lean. Now there's one other thing that's a concern anytime you're in the field, when you see a P1000 code, and that's unique to Fords, remember P1 codes are manufacturer specific. P1000 means somebody was in here and cleared these trouble codes. So what I need to make sure I'm doing with this vehicle is make it clear that the only two codes I'm addressing is the two lean exhaust codes. It is, it is possible that this vehicle has other failures that aren't showing right now because it, we didn't do the drive cycle yet, which is what this P1000 code means, that not all of the monitors, which is the tests, have run yet. There is potential for other faults here. Very important that you document your repair order in this case. We're attacking the PO171 and 174 trouble codes. The next thing we want to do with these codes is we want to go to our freeze frame data. Notice on the Ford menu that there's no way to access freeze frame data. So what you'd have to do is exit all the way back out of this vehicle and enter it as an OBD2 car to get the freeze frame because it was mandatory. Freeze frame data is supposed to be an OBD2. Well, the nice thing now that Snap-on has allowed us is a generic functions feature. So what this is is a window into OBD2 where I can, instead of exiting all the way back out, I can access my freeze frame data within that generic functions section. Here's my freeze frame. And what we want to pay attention to anytime you have a lean condition is you want to pay attention to whether or not this is an idle lean condition or an under load lean condition. And if you look at these data parameters, first of all, you look at your two long term numbers. Is that visible in there? All of that in there? Yes. Okay. You look at these two long term numbers and you see we're almost at 30% positive fuel trim on both long term fuel trim bank one and bank two. So definitely have a lean condition. Take note of this. We're at 1800 RPM with a 30 mile per hour speed and a 62% calculated engine load. So here's what we look at right away with this. We're trying to narrow down the type of lean condition we have. When I see something like that, to me, this is an under load lean condition. This is not an idle lean condition, so I'm not worried about a vacuum leak on this car. There's gonna be two areas we're gonna check for this under load lean condition. One's gonna be the mass airflow being dirty and the other one's gonna be a fuel pressure issue. So that's where we're going next. To address the mass airflow, I'm gonna exit out of here. Go, go to my, this is OEM data now. It's still my Mountaineer, so I'm out of global mode. I'm back in the manufacturer mode. Go to data display on Fords, go under drivability. What we're looking for is Barrow Frequency, Barrow HZ. Now, I know we haven't talked about this yet, but this number right here of 152 hertz, Barrow HZ, 152 hertz. The way barometric pressure is calculated on this vehicle is it's done from the mass airflow sensor. And there is no separate Barrow sensor. So the mass airflow senses the barometric pressure at wide open throttle. When you're driving this thing wide open, it's going to update this Barrow reading. Right? If you think about wide open throttle, there's no vacuum in the engine, full atmospheric pressure, that's where the Barrow gets updated. Okay? So if you have a dirty mass airflow, 
that doesn't anticipate the same amount of airflow, so there's more airflow than what it's showing, your barrow frequency will be lower because it thinks you're driving at a higher altitude. That being said, when you have dirty mass airflows on a Ford, you're gonna have under 150 hertz, 140, I've seen them as low as 137 hertz, and that's a red flag, you have a dirty mass airflow. Sea level reading, maximum you'll see here is 160 hertz. Here in Pittsburgh, we generally run about 154 to 156 range on the mass airflow uh, for a barrow calculation. We're at 152. And so what that's telling me, I'm not going after the mass airflow next, I'm going after fuel pressure. So our next step is gonna be fuel pressure. All right, so we're gonna do fuel pressure. It helps to have a spec, and this is a nice feature of the Varus that you have two tools in one. What I'm gonna do is hit the home button, and I'm gonna to go to my component test meter, and uh, the component test meter of the Varus is basically the Vantage Pro. So what you're accessing is um, front door or scope data uh, is what the component test meter does. But what's nice about the component test meter is it has all kind of specs for this vehicle. And this is unique to this vehicle. And a uh, nice thing about this is, look, I'm looking for fuel pressure. There it is. And there is a pressure spec already preloaded into this tool. That makes it wonderful. Now, this isn't the greatest spec in the world, but I got to tell you, I checked Mitchell too, and it says the same thing. And it's given me a really wide range of 30 to 65 PSI key on engine off. Then right underneath that, it says fuel pressure spec again, normal range 55 to 65 key on engine off. So which one is it? We checked Mitchell, it was the same thing. 30 to 65 PSI uh, key on engine off. Now with my experience with these, um, and, and this is what helps, that they generally run around 60 pounds of pressure with the car running. Now I'm not 100% sure on that number, but you see our range pretty wide, 30 to 65. All right, let's take a look at what the pressure looks like now. Okay, looking at fuel pressure, nice afford to uh, give us a Schrader valve to adapt to. Just gonna turn the key on, watch the gauge. Key's off right now, turn the key back on, that gauge sort of bumped a little bit. Did it move at all? It very slow. All right, so you see our key on engine off pressure is about 33 PSI. Now, is that a good number or not? I mean, if, it's, if the spec is 30 to 65, that could be a good number. Um, uh, from my experience, it should be higher on this vehicle, but here's the key. I don't care if it's 30. I don't care if it's 40, 50, 60, doesn't matter. The key is going to be doing this fuel pressure check on a snap throttle under load. And, and notice the spec didn't tell you to do that. Um, what we want to do is get the injectors to open very wide and make sure pressure doesn't drop on a snap. Okay, so we're going to do this engine running, snap throttle, watch the fuel pressure. Now before I do it, this is a vacuum type fuel pressure regulator. So it is normal to have a higher idling pressure than it is, sorry, backwards. It is normal to have a higher wide open throttle pressure with no vacuum than it is at idle. Generally about an 8 psi swing from idle to wide open throttle. So what I want to see on this system, let me double check what I'm saying here about this having a, having a regulator on the rail. What I'm looking for on this uh, fuel rail is a pressure line and a return line. Okay, I lied to you. This is not a return type system. This does not have a fuel pressure regulator on the rail. Here's how I know it, let me show you. All right, this is important for what I was about to tell you, talking about the vacuum assist regulator, um, is identifying the system type. There is only one fuel line running under this fuel rail, un um, running underneath the intake manifold. If you look down on the frame, you see that one one fuel pressure line, there is no other line on this system and so what that means is the regulator for this is in the tank and there is only one set pressure on this car. Whatever you have at idle is going to be the same pressure you should have at wide open throttle. There are not two different readings, one pressure. This is where um, doing fuel pressure testing is important that you understand that when you do fuel pressure checks, just key on engine off is not good enough. I don't care if that's the right spec. Uh, the injectors aren't spraying. You can have a weak pump keep up when the injectors aren't spraying. So can you start the car for me and we're gonna do some snap throttle tests. 
you do the screen with that? See that pressure drop? See how slow that's coming back? Let me get that in the screen here. I don't know if you caught that or not. Uh, let me move this gauge to a different spot without a glare. All right, that's a little better. I don't know if you caught that on initial startup, but it had a real slow climb in fuel pressure. And we could bleed that off and catch it again, but I don't want gas going everywhere. Uh, but here's the key. One set pressure on this system, which I believe should be about 60 PSI from my experience on other Explorers. At least the four liter engine I know runs 60 pounds of pressure. Uh, this is the five liter, so I'm not sure if it's different. But the key is this. When I snap the throttle, fuel pressure should not drop under load. Watch it. Is this still in the screen? Yeah. We okay? Yeah. Okay, let me rephrase that. This is a confirmed problem. We have a fuel delivery issue. Uh, if you think about that, you match that with our freeze frame data, lean exhaust, under load driving the car when the injectors are spraying heavy, fuel <coughs> pressure is dropping. And that's where our lean condition is coming from. Is this a bad pump? Could be, car's got, or truck's got 187,000 miles on it. Could this be a plugged up filter? Yes, could be either one. At this point, with this kind of mileage, our recommendation is going to be put a filter in it, retest it, or do them both. Pump and filter. There's one last thing that we need to address before we do that, and that's our pump power and ground. Now, unfortunately, we are in a shop that uh, does not have a rack over here. So I really don't want to climb underneath the vehicle to do a power and ground check on this pump. A poor ground, can give us low pump volume. A poor power feed can give us low pump volume. And I don't want to do that unless I have to. So what I'm gonna do is an amperage measurement at one of the feed wires to the pump and see what kind of amperage I have. And that'll tell me whether or not I need to crawl underneath this vehicle. So amperage measurement on the fuel pump is next. All right, I apologize for the shakiness of the camera, but I want you to see where we're at. Uh, we're going after the inertia switch, which is under the passenger floor kick panel area. And the reason we're going after the inertia switch is it carries the main feed that goes to the fuel pump. And I, don't, and I won't have to cr crawl underneath the vehicle to access it. And to give you an idea of what it looks like, that's it right there. There's a three pin connector on it. Most of them have two. This one has three because if the inertia switch trips on this one, it actually has an indicator light that comes on on the dash. But the heavy pink and black wire and the heavy green and yellow, uh, that's coming in and going out to the pump. Either one of those wires will be sufficient for a fuel pump current measurement. And that's what we're gonna do. I'm um, using my Pico scope to do it, using my low amp probe. And my amp probe is set on a 20 amp scale. Um, if you were not using a scope that had the conversions in it, it would be 100 millivolts uh, equals one amp if you were using a voltmeter. So these same amp probes work with voltmeters too. Clipping that around the wire, this is polarity sensitive. So uh, worst case scenario is I have to flip it around this way, put it back on if my pattern's upside down. But being I've already done this, that is the correct polarity right there. All right, we're going to the scope screen next, which is my laptop. All right, using the Pico 4000 and my laptop, and uh, I'm gonna click on the icon on my desktop for Pico 6, and uh, what I'm gonna do is um, set my scales here. Let me zoom you in on, on this so you see what scales I'm using 
for this uh, amperage measurement for the pump. And uh, I'm going to go channel A. And I'm going to set this because I'm using a, a calibrated uh, tool already. So we have calibrated scales for it. I'm going to set this probe to a um, our uh, 60 amp current clamp in the 20 amp mode. And um, when we look at our scales now, you see that these are amperage scales. I'm going to go minus 5 to 10 amp, which is a pretty good scale for doing a pump. And uh, you definitely would want to zero uh, your amp probe, which I've already done. So that line we're looking at right there is zero amps. And can we go ahead and start, why don't you guys start the car for me, please? hear the long crank time, a little pop in the intake. I don't know if you heard it, but those are all symptoms of uh, a lean condition. And in our case, that's symptomatic of, uh, of a uh, fuel pressure problem, the long crank time and how long that took to build. But uh, what you're looking at here is an amperage number. So these are, are actually, uh, the elect this is the electric motor spinning. The fuel pump is actually spinning in the tank. And each of these um, up down uh, kind of sawtooth pattern is a representation of a commutator segment on a DC electric motor. Uh, not too much concerned about uh, fuel pump speed and RPM, although we can calculate that and I guess I can show you that, but my main thing that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about was my amperage because truthfully what I said was I don't want to crawl underneath this vehicle and check the power and ground. And the fact that I have an average of five and a half amps of current flow traveling to this fuel pump tells me I don't need to crawl underneath this vehicle and check my power and ground. Now, if this amperage was real low, to be 100% accurate on what we're calling, which is low fuel pressure uh, and calling a pump, we would want to check powers and grounds. I'm comfortable with this test. We're done. This car needs a fuel pump and or has a plugged up fuel filter. And again, no way to know about the filter without replacing it. I mean, you could T a gauge in before the filter and T a gauge in after the filter, but by the time you were done doing that, you should have just changed the filter. It would have been a lot quicker. So change the filter. If this is your own car, change the filter and retest everything. Uh, if this is a customer's car in a shop, uh, you got to leave that up to them on what they want to do, but you have to warn them that the potential here is the, the fuel pump is on its way out too.